there. Oh, I'm sorry. I just um, clicked on the link, but it um, is asking me to request for access. Oh, I, I have permission to. Um, okay, let me try one more. It's not going to be a short link, but try the second one. Okay. Okay. All right, so I've started to record. So let me just say welcome everyone to the April 1st meeting of the Digital UR, the Digi URI Media Club. Um, I'm Samantha. As you guys know, I'm here in Hong Kong and um, happy to speak to you guys today and have a discussion about teaching in higher ed podcasts, digital literacy then and now. So Usually, as you know, my partner in crime, Michael Stopel from the American University of Paris is also joining us, but today he's actually in Cairo at a conference. So he's off in Egypt, and <laughs> so it'll just be me today. Um, and I'm glad you guys are here. Um, so, okay, yeah, so the link that I sent to you guys in the chat is the link to the agenda that we're going to follow today. So I thought that might be helpful both for me and for you guys, just so that you know like what's going on. And then our discussion questions are also um, further down as well. So um, yeah, so we'll, we'll just do, I'll do a brief overview of the podcast in case anyone wasn't able to listen to it. And then we'll have um, our first breakout topic and then come back and do a group review together and then do our second breakout topic, come back and do another group review. And then we'll just take a couple minutes to wrap up and talk about um, things coming up for next month. Cool. How cool. So that sounds like a great plan. Can we, before we begin though, can we go around the room and introduce ourselves? Cause like what a power group we have today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think there are some new people too. So yeah, that's a great idea. Renee, why don't you go first since you Okay. I'm Renee Hobbs at URI. So you, uh, I'm delighted that you're here and thanks for joining us. Don't forget about the summer Institute in digital literacy this summer. Registration is open, right? Hi, I'm Cheryl Rabbit. I'm new to the group. Hi, Renee. How are you? Nice to see you, Cheryl. An nice amazing, to see you as well. <laughs> amazing school leader. Who's, who else wants to introduce themselves? I'm Dana Serer. I'm over in Western New York. Hi, Dana. Hello. I'm Pam Sager. I'm also in Rhode Island with the Media Education Lab. Hi, Pam. Hi. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Divina. <laughs> yes, Renee, I'm going. Yes. And, uh, Hi, Divina. I, yes, hello. I'm from India. I'm doing my PhD communication from the University of Heidelberg. <clears throat> um, I'll go next. I'm uh, Mike Spikes. I'm sorry, I wasn't on the video. I'm using my phone right now. Um, I am, I was previously with the Center for News Literacy at Stony Brook University. And now I'm a PhD student in learning sciences at Northwestern University to look closer at news literacy interventions and the like. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Carla, Antonio, Tamson, Allison. So I'm Carla from Brazil. And I'm a teacher at the Federal University here, and I work with applied linguistics. And I love Rhode Island. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's great. I'm Alan Tamsin. I'm in Hong Kong, a dear friend of Samantha and an editor with the opinion section of the New York Times. Wonderful. Antonio. Hi everyone, my name is Antonio. I am a teacher from Colombia. Nice to meet. We are happy to see you. And you. and Allison. Ah, me Thank too. you. I'm I'm Allison Kenny. I'm in uh, Boston, but I love Rhode Island too. And I'm a oh, cool. <laughs> media literacy uh, workshop teacher for middle school and high schoolers. Wow, great. We're so glad you're here. All right, I'm, so I'm wanted to audit as much as I could. Sweet. So, so uh, Sam, thank you so much for bringing this amazing crew of people together for, I think, what's going to be a really cool discussion. I think so, too. And actually, we skipped Kate. So, Kate, Kate do you want to introduce yourself? 
Hi, yes, um, I'm Kate. I'm a second year PhD at the University of Toronto in Oise. Um, and um, my focus is on uh, language and literacies education with an interest in how age is influencing our information reception and practices. Awesome. Okay, so I think that's everybody. And of course, Yanti's only here in spirit. Um, I'm in control of his account today, <laughs> as always. Um, but I'm Samantha, I'm at the University of Hong Kong and I'm here in Hong Kong, as always, <laughs> um, uh, here doing a PhD. But I'm actually gonna be um, coming to Rhode Island for the Summer Institute. And then I'm gonna be staying um, through the rest of the year. So I'll finally be in your time zone for a little while, which is really exciting. Okay. Um, so with that, so why don't we start talking about the podcast? Um, so my, you know, my notes are kind of here in the, um, the agenda and I don't want to spend too much time getting into too much of the details of the podcast, but it's a fantastic podcast and I would encourage you guys to explore some of the other topics, um, that Bonnie goes into, but she's a professor at Vanguard University in Orange County and she has a number of different, um, positions where she trains both faculty and students on using digital tools and digital pedagogies. Um, and of course, Brian is a, a consultant and what he calls a futurist. I don't know if that's a, a common term or not, actually, but basically he makes, he kind of assesses, um, you know, the digital environment and kind of makes some predictions about where technology is headed and where tools are headed and how that might change or not, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, so basically throughout the podcast, they just have a conversation about, um, they start off talking about what is digital literacy. And of course, as probably all of us have experienced when it comes to anything, fill in the blank literacy, there's always a lot of debate and discussion around, you know, what that actually means. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in the discussion. Um, but they also go on to talking about predicting the digital future. And they talk about a lot of tools that have kind of come and gone and platforms that have come and gone. And that's a pretty interesting phenomenon too, because um, you know we don't really, you know, of course it's it's something that we can try to predict, but um, things are kind of popping up all the time, and we don't really know what's going to be adopted and not. So, um, but then they go on to talk about participation, which I think is really interesting. They talk a lot about um, some of the barriers to participation, um, and I really identified with with both of these topics, both the psychological and the technical bar uh, barriers to actually participating in online communities. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so first, let me just open it up to you guys um, and ask for any like burning thoughts or um, anything that you wanted to share about your experience listening to this podcast. And throughout the, uh, throughout the conversation, I'd like to ask all of you guys to, if there are any digital tools that you found particularly helpful in the classroom, if you could put um, a description or a link in the chat box, I'll collect them and send them out um, to everyone as links so we can all have those resources later. So with that, does anybody have any thoughts to start us off? I'll start. I think uh, one thing that I was uh, really um, surprised with was um, Brian Alexander, at the very end of the podcast, Brian Al Alexander's list of uh, readings weren't really at all about digital literacy. They were really about the future of higher education <laughs> and the vulnerable vulnerabilities in higher education. And I feel like that topic is something that once those of us who are inside higher education, it, uh, we don't, it's a place of denial. You know, we don't want to acknowledge how vulnerable higher education is, but I thought the fact that he's reading on that area, that was really interesting to me. And I thought, oh, okay, I wonder what the connections are between digital literacy and the vulnerabilities of the future of higher education. Yeah, really, well, kind of, kind of interesting, kind of scary. <laughs> I, I also, I teach um, educators in the public education system. So they're already service teachers, but I'm also working for Buffalo State College and working with graduate and undergrad students. And um, part of my repertoire is to have um, courses that are have an online or a blended type of um, format. And it's, it's a struggle for a pre-service teacher. So I kind of see where that disconnect is from like the higher education land into our classroom. So 
I am trying to bring that bridge together, but uh, I think it's this, you know, where, where during the schooling, our, um, our people, right, learning how to do this work as they are growing up. So it's not such a, a hurdle. It's, I mean, it's hard for, for graduate students. So I can't imagine, right, for some of the teachers that have been veteran teachers for, for a long time. Even new teachers, even two or three years, they struggle as well. So, yeah. Can I go next? Um, so, oh. Can, can you hear me? I just got a message that my internet connection is unstable. Oh, okay, you can hear me. Okay. Um, so I was um, intrigued by the European framework of competencies that they mentioned in the podcast. Um, I really feel, uh, believe that a lot of great work is lost on us because of the language issue. Um, I was lucky enough to um, be part of a summer school in Belgium where I came across a very interesting media literacy competency framework by Thierry de Schmidt and Pierre Fastre. Uh, but we don't really know about it so much because it's in French. So unless you know the language uh, or you find a translated version of it, uh, it's inaccessible. So maybe we should, um, I don't know, maybe INCR or ICA or um, I don't know, uh, NAMLI could um, look at bringing together a volume of uh, uh, translated uh, frameworks that are used in uh, non-anglophone uh, context. So, I mean, I jumped a few hoops there, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, I, I hope I'm making sense. Um, I do have one burning thought it was my only burning thought um, uh, upon listening to it, but it was a moment of surprise. And so that's why it stuck with me, which was when um, Brian Alexander br brought up the example of working with a bunch of Japanese students who were struggling trying to use Word. And he said, they all could use their mobile phones so well, but they didn't know how to use computers. And whoa, like I just had this moment of, what generation am I in and how did I under learn technology and learn my digital literacy? And what is it that the generations now, now who are coming up in different countries and depending on what technology, what they have access to, um, all, you know, all these different conditions and circumstances that shape digital literacy, especially in countries outside of outside of where I grew up in Canada. And so I've been thinking about that quite a lot. Yeah, that phenomenon, uh, I believe lives in the United States in our classrooms today. Teachers that are tech able and are using the technology, they're, they're basically, they're, they're the problem solver, the adult for the students and they keep on like, I thought you kids grew up with a tool coming out of the womb. Why don't you know how to use it? And I just wonder, right, it comes down to instruction. We use these tools for different reasons. And how do we use digital tools and our digital mindset for, for learning, for educational purposes, and not just for, for gaming or socialization? There's another area. And I think that could, again, be the disconnect. We have yet to figure out that bridge. You know, I, I, I want to respond to that because I think that's a really interesting observation about like, what are the disconnects, right? And one disconnect that I wish Brian and Bonnie would have talked about, but they didn't, is that unlike in K-12, where if teachers are going to integrate technology, they're going to do it on their, with their own steam, right? Because like, you know, the instructional technology person is servicing the whole friggin' building and the librarian has her own program. In higher education, there's a whole class of people called instructional technologists who are supposed to work elbow to elbow and help the faculty do digital things. And I have long wondered whether that strategy enabled or actually increased the disconnect in higher education because it created a class of specialists who are staff, not faculty, and who flitter from faculty to faculty kind of 
helping with little projects, but the faculty themselves don't ever have to acquire the digital literacy competencies because they can rely on these underpaid, overworked helpers. So I wonder if institutionally, the structures of higher education have increased in a way, ironically, by providing support, increase the disconnect. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, to me, I think that speaks a lot about the focus more on the tools than on the, like what was talked about in the podcast, the competencies themselves. So in particular, I know in the field that I'm in, in news literacy, a lot of people tend to focus more so on, like if I go in and do a workshop for teachers, the focus a lot of times for those teachers is on, well, how do I teach my students how to use social media better? And what I say to them lots of times is it's not about the, the tool that you're using. It's not so much about knowing how to use Twitter, knowing how to use Facebook, knowing how to use Snapchat and all these kind of things. I think it's more about, you know, the underlying core competencies that people should be thinking about when using these tools, because I think that does uh, present somewhat of a hindrance to teachers and to others who just say, well, I'm not very tech literate. They'll just say, oh, well, I don't know how to use these things, so I'm just not going to use them, and they get scared of them. And I think that sort of drives that disconnect where people feel like, well, I kind of know how to use the computer. I sort of know how to use this, but I definitely don't know how to do this thing. So it just sort of takes people away from that. I, I like to underscore what Michael just said. Uh, the takeaway for me um, in the Brian Alexander piece was that the digital natives are not as tech savvy as we often think they are and that older people, <laughs> and I'm an expert, are not as tech ignorant as a lot of people think they are, even as they think they are. In my workshops, my favorite line is always to say to teachers or librarians, they may know how to push buttons better than you do, but they don't know how their buttons are being pushed. And that's where you come in. It's the critical analysis piece. I thought the one line from the podcast when Brian was speaking about kind of the historic media literacy in the 60s and 70s, and then the changeover that began in the 80s with informational literacy, and, and through the Library of Congress, you know, that when we talk about futurism, they predicted that futurism to say, hey, if people are not, and students are not going to the library or using Library of Congress type of uh, skill sets, how will they know what sources are, you know, accurate or objective or be able to use that critical lens of where do you go find reliable sources so it seems like maybe this dilemma was already put out there but no one kind of saw the flames beginning to burn what what we see here most of the time is that people are very good at using cell phones Personally, they know how to use for personal purpose. That means they usually receive things. They don't produce much. And so they don't use computers a lot anymore, especially kids. They are using cell phones and families are getting rid of PCs the computers because they all have cell phones and they can solve their lives on the cell phones. And this means that they are doing less complex things in the sense that they produce only for our personal use and WhatsApp messages. And teachers know how to use computers, they know how to use cell phones, but they have no idea of what to do with that when teaching is concerned. They, they really don't know how to use. And they, they come from the point of view that the students know everything already. So I don't have to do much because they already know. I'm an old guy and I don't know much and the kids know everything. And this is a lie, this is, this is not how things work. There's a lot to teach, a lot to share, a lot to produce, and it's really dangerous to stay in this receptive view all the time. So it's scary. <laughs> we have to change this uh, landscape.
I think in the podcast, though, it was a nice um, summary or hopeful summary of the continuum from from the early stages of you know media um, literacy and then informational literacy and sort of to where we are now. And I think um, it, it's evolving both in higher ed and in K-12. I think K-16 is, is really, or pre-K-16 is really the conversation and, and purposeful use of, of the tools we have. Um, I think he, he made a statement in there, and I'll, look, I'll find it in the text so I can sh share it with you specifically, but where he says something about, um, so you know, the, po the po potential dangerous power of this, but then this en enormously hopeful power for humanity and I mean, that's the camp i'm living in and uh and that's the one i um hope to sort of contribute to in 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 the purpose of my work so i think that that matters so i thought a lot about the difference between digital tools and digital communities as i was listening to this because of course there are a lot of digital tools that are developing that can help us facilitate learning but then you know, many of these tools also kind of cross over into that community space. And when they talked about how a lot of times when we teach um, how to use these digital tools, like a lot of teachers will teach like the mechanics of it, but not like they end up submitting to the, the students end up to submitting in a silo and don't actually interact with each other or yes. participate in a community. And I really thought a lot about that, um, the psychological barrier, which I actually suffer from a lot myself. I don't use social media for that very reason. <laughs> um, and I've talked to other people, you know, as a former PR practitioner, that was actually a big problem for me. Um, and I, I felt targeted quite a bit, like working for a nonprofit doing online advocacy. So um, that really stuck with me. And I think this might be a good segue. I think we'll skip over the first breakout topic because it's... Um, uh, well, I think number two is more interesting. <laughs> um, and we've had a great discussion so far. So why don't I break us out into smaller groups and we can kind of, you know, if there's something else that grabs you, talk about that for sure. But um, if not, focus on breakout topic two and we'll come back in 15 minutes. Yeah? Okay. And let's see. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hey. Did it give you guys the one minute warning when I closed the rooms, or did it just put you back in? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're okay. Okay. We love you. No worries. No worries. Thanks. <laughs> it's not my fault at Zoom. <laughs> um, okay, so that was awesome. Um, who wants to talk about what they shared? Okay. I'm trying to think about the first thing that we talked a little bit about. I think we went back to um, the issue about creation. So uh, one of the things that popped up in the podcast that we discussed a little bit was um, that, uh, what was the gentleman's name? I can't remember. Um, the, the guest. Brian. Brian. Yeah, Brian, Brian Alexander. About, yeah. That Brian talked about was that a big part of digital literacy is about creation. It is also about consumption, it's also about interpretation and so on, but it's also about creation. So one of the things that I think was a central theme of our discussion in our breakout room was students understanding what it means to create and understanding like who you are communicating to. So knowing that now with these huge digital platforms that we have, that we, we ourselves have a platform to espouse our own thoughts, our beliefs and so on. But some of the things we talked about was for you know, a younger generation now that's coming up that's been enmeshed in this world now, 
they have a different understanding of what it means to interact with one another, what it means to communicate with one another. And we sort of wonder if that has played a bigger role in the ways that, um, that we've seen the effects of that sort of communication. So we talk about like out, you know, there's outrage every five seconds on Twitter, just because the platform itself is sort of set up in this way where people can just espouse, you know, I'm mad about this and I'm just going to say I'm mad. And then they really don't see what the consequences are. There's not really big consequences to that, but it would be much different if like in this particular situation where we are all looking at one another and I was to espouse, oh, this thing sucked. I hated this thing. I hated what this person said. You know, of course, I'm going to get some sort of pushback. So, you know, because that's not always there, does that change the way that young people are communicating with one another online, the ways they understand the consequences of their own words, who they're communicating to, what kind of message are they trying to communicate? Those are all these same sort of, I think they're like these underlying core ideas, competencies that we talked about a little bit earlier, competencies that we all have to interact with, you know, that may be different for the student, for the teacher, and so on. So that, I think that was a big thing that came up in our group. And please feel free to jump in if I may have misspoke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that reminds me a little bit of what we talked about with um, program or be programmed. The, I think that was our very first meeting and I can't remember the book that well anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> but they, he talked a little bit about that, like, you know, interacting online is just so different. Like our behavior is different and what's acceptable is different. So I think that's a really good point. So we talked a little bit about um, vulnerability, um, just kind of like, taking that a little bit further. And I, I had explained that even, um, it's really hard to get students to, to interact with each other. And for me here in you know, this part of the world, it's hard to get them to do that in person, but it's even harder to get them to do that online, right? Um, and I actually thought it might be easier to get them to do it online and it's not. But um, so like, I think part of my own vulnerabilities around communicating digitally kind of bleeds into how I introduce tools. So even, even those times where I'm using these really great tools for teaching purposes, a lot of times they have the component to go that extra step. Well, I, I shouldn't even call it an extra step. It should be an included step. But that shows you how I think about it automatically, right? Um, I don't actually go that, that step to, to actually make them use those community-based tools, like, you know, parts of the, of the platform, right? So I've been using um, uh, Flipgrid a lot this semester, and I could easily require them to like or comment on other people's videos, and I don't do it. And I should be, right? Like, I comment on their videos, but I don't actually make them do it. Um, but it also made me think a lot about, like, um, how can we actually provide a safe space? And we talked about some ideas and Davina had some really great ones around um, like practicing with debates um, and also like opening classes with music and things like that, where um, people actually can have a safe space to argue a point that they can kind of detach from a little bit. Um, but I'm wondering if you guys might have other, other techniques that, you know, like we were talking about things like getting very personal and like providing space to like just be open and vulnerable because learning is like it's really hard sometimes and it's it can be embarrassing to get it wrong or to you know misunderstand something so how can we make that a safer space for students to like interact with each other in person but especially online you know that is such a fascinating question and, and it uh it, it embodies a, a shift in my own thinking that has developed as i've been teaching online for now so many years um I, I used to reject the learning management system and make my students participate in learning in public, right, on the open internet. And I've increasingly been aware that students feel vulnerable to being learners in public. And so I do see that there's some value to playing with ideas and with relationships and expressing yourself in a closed threaded discussion or other sort of closed platform. There is real value to that because 
you can work out uh, your ideas with a smaller group in a safe way. So I, but I think it's also important to find ways to synthesize some of that work and put it out there in a public place. And uh, so for my students, we do that with Twitter, right? So Twitter is the place where you share your public ideas. Um, and there are risks associated with that. And I feel like in some ways, that's part of the learning experience, right? <laughs> so it's like, for me, almost a failure if nobody gets any pushback from their Twitter posts. It's like, well, then you didn't learn that <laughs> Being a public person online means people will talk back to you. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that idea of when it's okay to have a safe space as part of learning and when it's okay to be public as part of learning, they're both valid. Right, right. I think one of my personal and professional experiences these last few years, I've only had a smartphone for maybe like five years. So getting a flip phone and getting rid of the flip phone was like a big deal. But part of it was my former boss was like, you need to be doing this. How can you be an educator working with teachers if you're, if you're not living it? And what helped me was being involved with Twitter and on um, Twitter chats. So either social studies chats or professional development chats. And so you're still, even though it's open, um, it was like a little more of a safer place because there are people that were um, sharing a specific topic and, and learning. And... And that's where I think when I talk to my students today, I actually have class tomorrow night, so I have some new ideas for them, is you only had 140 characters. So you had to share and be concise on Twitter with people you may have never met, but you're talking about the same topic. So you, you need to stay on point, you need to be concise. And it did allow for opportunities to learn and get new links or new resources. At the same time, it shared an opportunity for you to hear from people where you might not have agreed with them. But again, it wasn't Twitter wide open, but finding a Twitter chat that fits you and your, again, becomes an echo chamber as well, um, but making kids aware of that too. So thanks for, for sharing the Twitter world. Yeah, one of the things that I, I think has come up a lot and I've been thinking about a lot is just scaffolding, especially in higher, higher ed, because I know it's something I talk with my own professors about that seems to be lacking. So in my own background, I was a high school uh, media studies teacher and, you know, scaffolding was like, you had to do it. You had to give students the ability to like, try things on a very small scale and then allow them to go even bigger. So I think there's a great example here in the Zoom meeting, like how, Samantha, how you broke us out into smaller groups. Like I find like that's even a sort of easier way to get folks like to give them enough space to sort of like talk. Cause sometimes when you're in a classroom with say 20 people, it can be really scary to be the first person that's just sort of throw something out there because yeah, you worry about what the pushback may be. Although even for myself, I've had occasions where, yeah, I want to engage in these sort of conversations with students in the class because sometimes the first question I have or the first comment I have is just, I don't know. Like, I just don't, I don't understand this. And that can be really, really hard for someone to admit, right? But they can do that in sort of like smaller groups. And I'm glad that that the last comment about, you know, finding that chat, that smaller chat, and then seeing how you interact with people there is a really great way of doing this. So I just feel like scaffolding is a great way to give students sort of agency so that they feel like they can start speaking. So you put them in smaller groups. They feel like they can talk, you know, they talk with, you know, three or four people is much different than trying to talk with the whole group. Sometimes you have those that speak up more than others. They can sort of represent, you know, the whole group and so on. And again, that starts to build agency. So I think scaffolding is a huge part of trying to do that. I, th I was going to, there's a component that I think is next. Can you all hear me okay? Um, the uh, component that's next to agency, which I think is part of what makes students hesitant is sort of like, where do the where do the protocols for how you interact with people get established? And if they're established in their face-to-face -face world, then when they're all of a sudden in a non-face-to-face -face world, it's like, okay, so what are the roles here? How do I know how to behave? How do I know, you know, um, I was thinking about, you know, students who get, uh, who get in trouble with some of my colleagues because their emails aren't professional enough. And it's like, well, you know, the email world doesn't necessarily always lend itself to 
you know, professionalism, like dear doctor, whoever. I mean, often emails start with hi, right? Because it's kind of a little bit more informal. So I think for students, it's very challenging to figure out what the right, you know, sort of like the right register to land in a situation is. And that makes them, you know, doubt how to express themselves too, so. I'm just going to comment on that, uh, Ralph, because, and I'm making a, I'm, I'm going to try to comment on it in the chat as well. Uh, I think that's some, that captures something of what we talked about in our uh, small group. We talked about um, how we are creating assignments that force students to collaborate with each other online. And that um, students don't always have norms of participation that are conducive to collaborating online. So we talked about how in Google Docs, um, you, if you go in and you're collaborating on a document together, but if you go in, like, or if I go in and erase all of your writing, your, your partner's going to be pissed off, right? And that if I use suggested, I suggest you remove this entire paragraph, that that would be like kinder and better. And that N the norms of participation almost that's what goes back to Michael's point about scaffolding. It's like, I can't, you, uh, Ralph, you're right. I'm going to learn my norms of participation from my face to face world. Some of them are going to apply to the online uh, collaboration and others are not right. So how do we, could, could we be more explicit about those norms or how could we co-construct the norms together? Maybe for a particular assignment. And I'll just add what I added in the small group. Uh, as a prevention um, specialist, um, I worked a lot with kids around uh, dysfunctional family stuff where the rules were don't trust, don't talk, don't feel. So <laughs> if those were your rules, of participation in a community in the in the family where you were growing up we also have to do some unlearning in our scaffolding yeah probably lots of times for the instructor i can remember for myself being in situations like that i had to present and model what what those behaviors looked like so what did i want my students to do how did i want them to communicate with me i had to model that for them and you had to be almost you know, you had to be explicit with that. Like you, you have to say like, I'm gonna to speak to you in this sort of way because this is the way I want you to speak to me. And I'm making that very clear to you, right? Mm -hmm. So it is about, like you say, it's about unlearning and giving them and putting together that sort of space so that they know that they can, you know, this is a place of interaction. This is a place where we'll talk about ideas. This is a place where we will talk about how you feel about things. And you should not feel like you don't this isn't a safe space for you to do that in the best, you know, use of the phrase. Right. Yeah, and I think it's partially like learning uh, or, or trying to teach how to use sarcasm online because that's a, you know, it's, it's so often misread. <laughs> and in, and in K-12, it's, in person, it, it can be it can be brutal. It can be absolutely brutal in a classroom and shut a classroom down. Um, that's that that standard for teachers in in creating a classroom that is um, safe for intellectual and academic risk taking. That is so important early oh early on that kids feel like they have something to say that I can contribute. Um, I know my stuff, right? That that knowledge. I have this content. I've learned this content. And yeah, um, the issue of my family norms. That's it's big about your identity. Um, I used to joke all the time. Not, not very funny, but I, but it was a way for me to sort of process. I used to say that I was bilingual and that my first language was you know profanity. Uh, that's the <laughs> kind of language that was around my kitchen table, and it was. It was tough. It was hard for me to navigate. Um, so to go and 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 um, understand what it meant to be part of an academic community, even as a little kid, I was a smart kid, and that made that set me apart from my brothers and sisters in that I could do school, but um, 
it was still really hard for me to process those worlds. Um, and so my empathy for my, my students, my teachers, or others that sort of think about all those multiple identities as they, as they come to any table, whether it's in person, whether it's digital, virtual, whatever it is. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that, Cheryl. And, and, and Dana, you just shared a unbelievably great resource in the chat room. I'm, I'm like, I can't wait to take a hold of it. Can you just uh, give us a little summary or capture yeah. a little bit why so, we should look at it? Because it looks yeah. really great. It, it comes from the work of Garmston and uh, Casca. I gotta look them back up to, to be for sure. Uh, but it's work that developed in my, my former um, profession and uh, people used to make fun of us because we would always start a meeting or professional development around the big seven norms. And when we, we would ask people, which norm are you good at? Which one do you want to get better at? <laughs> you know, pay attention to self and others, right? Putting ideas on the table or taking an idea off the table is what we've added to that line. And um, in the, our first year and even two years of it, people would totally make fun of my group and be like, hey, you guys talking norm, wah, wah. But after working with a series of teachers over time, I am not kidding you, they now talk in norms as well. And they'll start their conversation to say, you know what, I want to pay attention to what you're saying, <coughs> or, you know, I'll put an idea on a table now, or I would like to inquire more about, but I still need to advocate for my students in my classroom. So it took a long time, but it became a way of, of talking. Again, when we talk about that civil discourse, again, we began using these norms in the hot bedded thick of the Common Core in New York State. Uh, they lived in our ELA modules. They were um, a program for ELA K through um, eight. And again, uh, some teachers didn't understand when you ask your kids to collaborate, just, hey, go get in a group and collaborate, like WTF, what does that mean, right? So I understand your, your language of kitchen table cursing, right? Um, uh, Right, so what does that mean? How do you teach that? How do you monitor that? And there's another set that I'm trying to pull up. Um, there are 12 norms. Uh, again, you can come up with any set of norms. And again, it, it's very beneficial to develop those norms, say with your students, like what is, it, what is the norm for online collaboration or online posting? Um, I did put forward um, a list of 12, which I'm looking right now, and I can't seem to find it on my Google Drive. So I will find it and I'll post ones that are specific to online discourse. But again, it goes back to the point, it takes time to build that sense of um, comfort or confidence to do this work. And even when people poke fun at it, at it you, gotta, you gotta put your stake in the ground that this is the way we do business here. And it's not about having a classroom rule, it's just, this is the way we do business. So that's that language. Awesome. I think that's a great note to leave on. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. I'm really excited to take a look at that as well. So like I said, um, all of the resources that you guys have put in here, I'll um, copy and paste into an email and send it around when I send the video around to everyone later this week. So even if you like over the next couple of days, as you're thinking back on this conversation, if you think of a tool or something that you'd like to share with us, send me an email and I'll include it in that list because these are really, really helpful. Um, so just a couple things to wrap up. Um, our next meeting is actually going to be on April 29th instead of the first week of May because um, the Media Education Lab actually has quite a lot going on those couple of weeks. So um, that's the best day for us to have it. Um, so we'll be um, Monday, April 29th, 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, and then I have a link here in our agenda to vote for the next title. And like I mentioned in the beginning, we're trying to put together a book, a podcast, and a video each time so you can vote on whichever one you prefer. This time around, we have two books and a video because we're very shy on podcasts. So please send more podcast recommendations so that we can include them every week. Um, speaking of which, um, further up in the agenda, I linked to another episode of Teaching in Higher Ed, which, in which Bonnie um, interviews Mike Caulfield, who literally wrote an online book about digital literacy, which is really interesting. So check that out or um, vote for it if you want, or let me know that you'd like to vote for it. Um, and also, we always invite you guys to host these sessions. So the last few ones, um, Michael and I have been hosting. Um, but please, please host. It's really fun. It's, um, you know, we'll totally support you on the technical side. So all you have to do is just be prepared to 
chat a little bit and think of a couple questions to throw out to the group and it's it's fun so um with that i think we're done thanks everybody see you next month <laughs>